if I'm not mistaken. So I want you to know that those of you who are here are part of an institution. I talked to Brother Christopher over here, who was a high school student the last time I spoke. He has since become the president of the student body at, at uh, Minnesota State, uh, finished his degree, and now he's teaching, he's bringing in his own students to be a part of this. So we want you to know this is what institution Now, I'm going to be kind of brief and to the point. You have already been burned out by Bishop Stallings. I didn't, I didn't hear him, but I know what he does. And so I know he showed out here a couple of hours ago, so you probably can't take too much more tonight. So I will do my best I can do and sort of move on out. You know, um, this part of the country is not African country. Uh, I'm from Florida, and uh, I'm not accustomed to seeing all of that white stuff, and I'm not accustomed to these temperatures, so I have to somehow like speak quickly and get back to the heat. And that's what I'm going to try to do. With the name of God, who is most gracious and most merciful, and in the presence of our ancestors, we stand on mighty shoulders. And we invite those shoulders to be here with us that we may continue to advance the cause which was established long before we got here. This conference is something that some people may not fully appreciate, particularly some of the younger participants and perhaps some of the participants who are not African Americans. Why do this? Why? talk about these things? What is the significance of this event? Well, we are in recovery. We are in recovery. We, like many other people who have been oppressed at various points in their history, have to somehow do some things to restore our humanity. One of the things that has been missed is a failure to give an account of what is going on in America. There's been a failure to discuss what happened to the Native American population, wow. what happened to the Asian people, particularly the Japanese when a war was declared. No one wants to discuss the institution of slavery outside of Abraham Lincoln's emancipation. Somehow we as a nation are operating in an illusion that everything is everything. And what are they complaining about? Somehow because of that lack of information, not only do we suffer, America suffers. Because as long as the foundation on which we stand is a faulty foundation, then our uh, integrity as a nation is in jeopardy. And because of the jeopardized integrity, America does not have a, a clue as to why we are still mad as hell. And we are mad. You know, one of the insults that people like to put on me and Bishop Stallings and all these other people who talk about Pan-Africanism and the restoration of African people is that, oh, they're just so angry. <laughs> well, why are they so angry? Well, if you knew what I knew, you'd be mad as hell, too. So the bottom line is that the anger is not something that is a paranoid condition based upon delusional manifestations of unknown realities that operate out It is, in fact, a real disturbance about ancestors who are still uneasy in their graves. It is about a nation of people who somehow still operate on disparities that they feel justified in. It is about the fact that we are still struggling to recoup and regain our humanity. Now, tonight, within that context, uh, and with an understanding that this conference is one of many efforts to try to bring the kind of information to our young people 
so that they can build a new nation. Because as we go into this new millennium, we cannot perpetuate the insanity of days gone by. We must begin to build on truth and build on understanding. Now, my message is one that is addressed particularly to the needs of African-American young people. It is not a message that everyone can profit from, but my specific objective is to talk to African-American young people. Why? I'm a black psychologist. Don't apologize for that. That is that I primarily specialize in the craziness of black folks. <laughs> And I am a specialist. I have spent 30 years doing nothing but thinking about the psychological problems and the psychological strengths and the psychological capabilities of African American people. That's my specialist. Now Freud dealt with crazy white people. Maslow did. Skinner did. In fact, all the books that have been written have been written about crazy white people. By white psychologists. And they have every right to do that. I ain't mad at them. But they don't know me. They don't know my mama. They don't know Marcus. They don't know Malcolm. They don't know Martin. They don't know Harriet. They don't know Zora Neale. They don't know the geniuses of our world. So I have made it my business to speak to the psychology of ourselves. I want to talk about regaining self-control. How do we regain self-control? The history of slavery and oppression was a, just not a kidnapping of bodies. It was a kidnapping of minds. The process of American slavery and then its subsequent disasters was intended to destroy the consciousness of African people. That's not the only people who've suffered this. The Native Americans are still trying to find their selves back. Many of the people have somehow been lost in this madness, in this illusion that's claimed to be America while systematically leaving out significant groups of people, defining them to the hinterland of non-reality. But what has happened to us, which is why slavery is still going on in our minds, is that the institution of slavery was necessary in order to make it work. It was necessary to wipe out our own self-consciousness. So we don't do for ourselves what other people do for themselves. We find it unusual to somehow think of ourselves in a positive light. We're probably the only people that somehow have to apologize for being with each other. Well, why are you all sitting together all the time? Why don't you sort of like spread out and mix in? You don't tell anybody else to do that. Why can't we, if we, if we want to hang out with each other, let's hang out with each other. But the bottom line is that we somehow get uh, called upon to apologize for what other people do. Why can't we take our money and spend it with us? Everybody else does. I mean, you have a, uh, down in Miami, you have a little Cuba town, you have a little Havana, you got little Haiti, you got little everything. You go to Los Angeles, there's the Mexican town, there's the Chinatown, everybody got a town. But if you get a black town, it's called a ghetto. <laughs> child at this Montessori advanced school out there in the suburb. And you proud of that? The fact that your child is faced with daily stress? <laughs> and then when your little girl comes home trying to call her hair, call, uh, trying to throw her hair, 
Hello, Steve Pong. It's because she's the only one. And therefore, but the point is, is that we don't understand the significance of trying to work together, be together, and to love ourselves the way that other people do naturally. I mean, there are Catholic schools. I mean, the, the state of Minnesota is like peopled and settled by Scandinavians who came out of Europe and settled here in large numbers. And they have schools named after them in all kinds of institutions. And no one accuses them of being reverse racist because they like to celebrate their own heritage. But if we start doing anything like that, there has to be a Congressional Medal of Honor, a Congressional session to determine whether we have a right to do what other people do. And in fact, we'll call militants if we want to name one little street Martin Luther King Street. And you better not name it Malcolm Street. You're in real trouble then. And the idea is that we don't comfortably do what other people do because slavery and oppression has robbed us of our own self-identity and self-control. Now, if it is in the nature of human beings to engage in a process of advancing and enhancing who they are, that's what people do. People are about preserving their lineage and enhancing the development of their offspring. We come into this world standing on the shoulders of people who died to make sure we got here. And we then have a responsibility to ensure that our children will have it even easier. That's our responsibility. Not just black folks, this is a human responsibility. That's why people build wealth. That's why people build institutions. That's why people do scholarship. That's why people do research. They are about ensuring the celebration of those behind them and ensuring the continuation of those coming after them. That's what people do. When you don't engage in that, that means that you are not living up to your human responsibility. And a part of what slavery did to us was to make us totally dependent on other people's reality and not on our own. So we celebrate other people's ancestors. We talk about our first president, George Washington. We talk about our government. We talk about our constitution. We talk about our declaration of independence. We celebrate our stepfather, or foster father, Thomas Jefferson, and his declaration of independence. All men are created equal and ensured by their creed, and we serve the inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and what have you. We somehow engage in celebrating other people's reality. One of the reasons that Bishop Stallings had to establish the Black Catholic Church was the idea that we were even worshiping people who looked like other people as God. We somehow bow down, hailing Mary, and Mary looked like nothing like your mama, your auntie, your sister, or yourself, and found no contradiction in that. But somehow did not even raise the question of why, why it is, why it is that you never see other people bowing down to your black self and representing you since nobody knows the real color of God anyway, whether it was male or female, whether it was black or white. If you really don't know the color, then why don't you represent it as anything? And if you're going to represent it as white, you can also represent it as black. And you wouldn't have very many white people coming there to bow down saying Hail Mary to a sister with braids and black skin and a nice full African nose. Let's not even go that far, because I know y'all get sticky about theology, don't they, Bishop Stone? <laughs> we can't even get white folks to show up to the black Santa Claus. You know, like in many cities, in this effort to somehow equalize the playing field. They've got this big fat white man with a red suit who allegedly comes even through black neighborhoods <laughs> on Christmas Eve night, riding reindeer, dropping stuff off. <laughs> and he comes unaccompanied except <laughs> and a reindeer with a red nose. Now, and so people line up their 
their children for hours to be able to stand in line and take a picture sitting on the white, fat white man's knee. All right? Now, that's fine. But the interesting thing is, is that usually black children will protest to their own mothers and fathers, mama, I don't want to sit on that man's knee. <laughs>
of European Americans dealing with African Americans to suggest that they will, out of conscience, do the Ooh, right thing. That's right. Okay, that's Everything they've done, they've been forced to do. Right. Slavery is over because of the whole effort to somehow bust it up. It had become such a, it's Frederick Douglass's voice, the voice of these people who were somehow speaking to the moral cult, the conscious of the world, and raising fundamental spiritual questions about the practice of this abomination called slavery in America. People around the world and those who had a little conscience began to respond to it. And therefore it began to cause a disturbance within the nation. The whole kind of economic disparity that was created by having this free slave market known as slavery created a kind of a, a, a diversion, created a kind of division, if you will, within America that led to the culmination of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln did not eliminate slavery or at least decree it because he loved black people. It was not a moral decision. It was a political decision to preserve the unity of Europeans who otherwise were about to fall apart. The nation was not able to stand any longer. That's what he said in Gettysburg. He says that the experiment, this experiment of trying to unify all these nationalities out of Europe was about to fall apart around the issue of slavery. So in order to preserve white unity, he legally eliminated slavery as an institution. Right. Right. Now go read the real stuff. Right. Go read the facts. So the point is, is that that's how it happened. How do, how do you think we were able to begin to attend institutions of higher learning? How do you think we got in the front of the bus? How do you think we were able to arrange for you young people to be able to eat McDonald's hamburgers no. at the front door? Okay. How do you think we arranged for you to be able to go to the bathroom if you traveled from here to Mississippi and wouldn't have to somehow like hold your water from the borderline of Illinois all the way down to Mississippi? How do you, how do you think we did that? You think that people said, well, it is in our economic interest to be ensure the opportunity for everybody to spend their money with us effectively, and therefore we're going to let every, anybody who has money come to McDonald's. Anybody who has money can stay at our Holiday Inn. Anybody who buys gas, he can go to our bathroom. Hell no. 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 That was not the way it was done. It was done by people being beaten to death That's to right. drink nasty coffee just to be able to prove their right to do so. I mean, people were beaten Families were destroyed. Yep. Uh, houses were burned. Churches were bombed. Because people wanted to be treated as people. And you know what? To this day, America has not raised her voice in consensus and says, this is despicable. Let, I'm not talking, you know, People talk, well, you know, we came here struggling hard, too, from Ireland. And we, 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 we didn't have to do anything to hurt anybody. Well, neither did you do anything to help anybody. You were comfortably sitting on your behind, letting those rednecks in Mississippi kill and murder and kidnap and destroy and lynch and do all those. And you did nothing as a nation. As a nation, you did nothing. So you participated by benign neglect. I'm talking about the nice good liberals talking about what it is down south. Well, what were you doing up north? The bottom line is that nothing was done. And because of that, America would not have changed had we not challenged the system in a way that caused them, caused them disturbance and did it consistently. So my point is, is that it's because of things that we did, that we initiated, that began to bring about change. Do you believe, I mean, you, you turn on TV now, and every athletic event, every basketball game, every football game, mm -hmm. every musician mm -hmm. just about, Be except careful. Eminem has taken away the rap reality all the time. <laughs> Fix y'all, didn't <laughs> You think you had a black thing, you know, they'll took it and make this thing. But the bottom line is that you turn on all these things and you assume that we've always been the chief of the NBA, the chief of the NFL, that we've always been somehow the entertainers and the comedians, that we've always been Martin Lawrence and every place you turn, there's some opportunity for that. That ain't true. 
We are there because people die. Literally die to let you get on and act a fool. <laughs> I'm serious. That's right. In order for you to get out there and shoot that basketball for a million dollars a year, people die to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Suffer all kind of humiliation. Right. Please understand, white people, black people, Native American people, Asian people, this is not the goodness of America. This was people struggling to take back their self-control. And because somehow there were people, and by the way, it was always a few, never the majority. Whether we were escaping slavery, Harriet Tubman used to have used her gun on other slave, on slaves who didn't want to go. She never used it on any of the oppressors. God took care of them. They couldn't catch up with her. They couldn't find this little black lady running up and down the East Coast. Couldn't even find her. But the one she had to use the gun on was on particularly brothers right. who were scared to run. Scared to run. That's how much our manhood, our humanity, our natural thirst for freedom had been completely dissipated by the institution of slavery. After nearly 300 years of being in this barbaric thing of having our minds taken from us, we didn't even feel comfortable escaping. So it took a little short black lady who had talked to God and knew that God wasn't in the clouds somewhere, but God was wherever she was. And because she knew that so well, she saw no danger coming from outside. She understood the only danger was coming from inside. the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. Young people, if you don't know Harriet, you missed our saint. Mm -hmm. This is one of our saints. And you got to understand, we got some black saints. Yes, we got do. black martyrs. Mm -hmm. We got black prophets. Mm -hmm. yes, you need do. to understand that God didn't leave us out here alone. Mm -hmm. That somehow the way that he talked to other people and brought them out of captivity, we too have been brought to where we are by divine spiritual powers that transcend and replicate the spiritual powers that are recorded in other people's scriptures throughout the world. So you must understand your relationship to spiritual divinity and understand it's not a foreign enterprise, it is in fact a very local and a very immediate reality. Now, how do we take back our control? If all of this has happened to make us dependent on other people, that has somehow turned us away from ourselves, that somehow prevents us from doing for other people, or doing for ourselves what other people do, how do we restore our own self-control, our own humanity? Three quick things. Number one, self-knowledge is the foundation for self-control. That is that if you don't know who you are, then you can be anything. Uh. And check us out. No. We are anything. Mm. I mean, you find us with a, a Hare Krishna braid. You find us like with no clothes on, like it was a Foxy Brown. You find Ooh. us like trying to outdo everybody else's insanity. I mean, you find us with a crack pipe or a pipe of crack. You find mm. us selling dope for people who are making billions of dollars and we make a half a thousand. So <coughs> somehow, we are busily being anything because we don't know who we are. And because we don't know who we are, we somehow costume as anybody else's reality. It is so strange to find black people who somehow celebrate everybody else's culture but their own. I mean, they really get turned on about uh, Columbus Day. <laughs> Native Americans who should go into mourning on Columbus uh -huh. Day. Right. Celebrate. Oh yeah, this is Columbus Day. This is when Columbus discovered America. And, and they, they can't help themselves. They don't know that kidnappers came, right. captured their ancestors, right. and proceeded to put a 400 year clamp on their humanity. Right. Put them, unlike other human beings, in land that they selected for. And then they have to fight every year to maintain that. Okay. And as soon as they find something valuable on that, they run them off that. And give them the illusion of being Americans. Whereas they decide what to teach them in school. And they don't teach them about the power of the suit. They don't teach them about the power of their own people. 
They don't teach them their history of the Incas people, the Aztec people, who understood a kind of concept of science and spirituality that the rest of the Western world still does not understand. They don't understand that they are of a lineage independent of a European lineage, that they have a reality that goes beyond anything that America can claim or Europe can claim. They don't know the dignity of their specialness. They're too busy trying to be like Columbus. Mm. And black folks are just as crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Busily trying to be anything but themselves. Look at that little boy, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. And it's true. It's true. Don't you be with me like you ever seen. Okay. You ever seen what happened to that boy? <laughs> you saw what happened to that boy? <laughs> little cute, brown, brown oh, yes. skin, yes. nice looking uh, Afro boy and stuff with a, a nice African nose that brought in good oxygen all the time.
the tribal self, the personal self, the social self, uh, and, and most importantly, the spiritual self. And all of this constitutes an inescapable dimension of our Mika. Now, Western psychologists only talk about the personal self, the ego, the id, the appetites, the sexual drives, and the aggressive drives that somehow interact together in the unconscious and begin to converge in, in confrontations with the ego that serves as somehow a buttress to somehow like block the expressions of those things that are based in the animal nature and basically the human being mm -hmm. is no more than a struggle between those kinds of animal instincts and the kind of people that they have. we have which makes us a part of each other and our tribal identity that is that we share a consciousness based on what people have been through before we got here so I don't care who you are if you have a part of Africa in you then you carry a consciousness that we all share I don't care if you came here later and I don't care which nation out of Africa you came from. You are African. I don't care whether your slave ship dropped you off in Trinidad and Tobago, and somebody else's ship dropped them off in Jamaica, somebody else's ship dropped them off in Haiti. You are the same African that came out of Nigeria, that came out of Cameroon, that came out of Ghana. You are the same foundation. You are connected to the people who laid the foundation for the mighty pyramids and built the temples in ancient Kemet that served the foundation for both the theological and the, uh, the, 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 the intellectual and the scholarly uh, ideas that preceded modern Western civilization. That laid out the concept of the merging of spirit, mind, physical, and mental things coming together that recognized the divine symbolism and everything in nature, understood the lion meeting with the human head as being the coming together of the spirits of beast and that of the intelligence of man, somehow fused together by the concept of spirit. Being able to understand the, the convergence of mathematics and architecture and all other kinds of things together making a new reality. The fact that you are the, that foundation too. That's a part of who you are. You laid the foundation for what the Greeks later learned. You laid the foundation for what Aristotle built on. You laid the foundation for even modern concepts of math and medicine and everything else, every other kind of science. You don't have to ask anybody for anything. Long before there was a Rome, long before there was a Greece, long before there was a Paris, long before there was an England, long before there was an Oxford, there was a Kemet, there was a Nubia. There was a concept of the human being as being something so transcendent that the modern world still can't replicate it. They still don't know how those brothers laid out the foundation for their pyramid. They've tried every computer system they can come up with trying to replicate it, and every time they put it up, it falls down. They don't know how those multi-ton stones were transmitted out of the quarries way down in Upper Egypt and brought all the way up to Lower Egypt and put there in that place that is now not, not, uh, in, there in, in, in the middle of the desert outside of Cairo. The bottom line is that they still don't know how we did what we did. <laughs> they don't understand the convergence of holistic reality, of medicine and science working together. They don't understand the relationship between spirit, mind, and body. They don't understand the interconnection between all those forces being inseparable and inextricably bound together. They have no idea how the world is really put together. They don't know how the people of, some of the Dogon people were able to read the Syrian star system and understand its cycles and not only predict the weather, but predict the movement of the Earth thousands of years before Galileo ever created a telescope to understand that the world was not, the Earth was not the center of the universe, but in fact, it was in fact revolving around one sun that revolved around multiple suns and galaxies moving all together. And the Dogon people had that in their mythology. 
long before Galileo peeped into outer space. See. Now you see, Copernicus, Galileo, those are the names we know. Mm -hmm. But the people who laid the foundation for science that came later, we don't even know the people, mm -hmm. much less than their names. Mm -hmm. This begins to let you know, brothers, sisters, there is nothing that is beyond your grasp. <coughs> A part of your slavery condition has convinced you that you can play basketball, you can do raps, you can make music, you can play football, you can run track, but they haven't told you that you can define and extend the calculus. They, they haven't told you about your capacity to understand travel in outer space by going into inner space. They, they haven't told you about the relationship between the earth and the stars and the fact that the sentiments of the human being are moved by the magnetic pull of, in, of, of, of bodies out in space. They haven't told you that somehow you can discover things in medicine that you don't have to require other people to do. Yes, we can deal with AIDS as a plague to our communities. But somehow our genius is stifled. We're somehow doing all of our time and energy trying to understand melanomas. Black folks don't get melanoma. But large sums of money go into the study of melanoma. We study AIDS, but we study AIDS as it impacts on other people. We don't understand what is going on with this AIDS thing that interacts with black people on such a consistent basis, whether it's in Africa or in North America. Somebody in Howard, somebody in Mahari, somebody sitting in this room needs to make that your objective. And Michael George and some of the rest of our athletes and educators, you need to fund the foundation so we can do unapologetic research. All right. Because it ain't just accidental that all these black folks are being taken out by this plague. Let's understand what's going on. And people are looking at it as a generic disorder, and it ain't generic. It is selective and devastating. But we ain't got no research labs. Every city just about got a production studio so y'all can go make some music. Everybody got a gym. If you ain't got a gym, you got some hoops. I understand y'all shoot hoops on ice out here. Everybody got some place to do things that you feel skilled in. But most of our schools where most of our children go don't even have microscopes. They don't have a sense of understanding that they were the mothers and the fathers of research. You shoot Ben Carson out there and treat him as if he's the only one. He is one that got away, who began to use his skills and talents. Uh, 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 all the people who somehow have done remarkable things, we like to treat them as exceptions. I want you to know they are typical. They are descendants of Imhotep. The ancient physician who actually became worshipped as a deity of medicine by both Africans and Greeks. That somehow we need to somehow understand our power as a people. A part of the conspiracy, young brothers and young sisters, is that you ain't supposed to know who you are. The fact that the schools don't tell you. The fact that your mom and daddy don't know. And unless you go to Bishop Stalin's church and Willie Wilson's church and two or three others, you don't hear it in church either. You don't know who you are. Don't you know that we are a living miracle? Yes, we mad and we were victimized. But that ain't the real deal. The real deal is that we survived it. We are still here. I, I challenge you to go find any people who endured 400 years of what we've endured and are as civilized as we are. <laughs> now, we are free, but we are civilized. <laughs> now, check this out. I mean, do you realize that uh, uh, W.B. Du Bois, less than 30 years, I guess a little over 30 years, after the Emancipation Proclamation, had a PhD from Harvard? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, let's talk about that. Yeah. Mm. Test-giving people, 
<laughs> People who are convinced that black folks perform on the test floor at the lower end of the bell curve, and therefore we are not capable of performing in the upper quartiles of performance and proving that our intellectual capability doesn't operate at the level of real competence and cognitive skills that other people are able to do. They might even have the ability to search out of conceptual and intellectual abilities that we don't have, and our abilities are really just associative abilities. That is, we can rotely remember stuff, and we can't really uh, do things in a conceptual way. We can't lay out new creative concepts. We can only replicate what we do. You go check that out. Go find out how this person whose people just came off the plantations walked through Harvard and left their velvet covered dissertation and went on to master multiple levels of knowledge. Who was a historian, who was a sociologist, who was a political scientist, who was an economist, who was a literary, a poet, who was somehow able to do things at multiple levels. He didn't have one skill. He, like so many others, had multiple skills. 30-some years after 1865, this brother walked out of the peaks of Western civilization, peaks of Western academic institutions. And not only that, look at y'all. Mm -hmm. Way up here. <laughs> way, way, way. <laughs> In the snow, in the tundra country. <laughs> White snow and white people, as far as the eye is. <laughs> Don't you know you're a miracle? <laughs> Let me give you a suggestion. Encourage some of those white folks who talk about you to go on down to Albany State and spend a semester. Go to Fitz, right. spend a semester. Go over to a Morehouse and spend a semester. Go down to Tougaloo and spend a semester. Okay. Let them be the only one in the physics class. That's right. Let them be the only one in the literature class. Okay. Let them be the one who the teacher learns the name first yeah. because they stand out like the soul. Let them be the one that every time they raise their hand, Everybody in the class looks to see what is the white person going to say. <laughs> That's what you go through. Every one of you, particularly if you bright as you all are, particularly if you are not intimidating, you got the nerve to speak up and let Africa speak to you. Those of you who will come out and express your mind, you scare the hell out of them. <laughs> Everybody in the class is watching. Yeah. And don't you get a 98. Uh -uh. The teacher will call you into the office and say, where did you get these answers? <laughs> well, I damn sure didn't get it from anybody in this class. <laughs> You need to read John Henry Clark. You need to read John D. Jackson. You need to read the writings of people who have been trying to recreate and restore our history. You need to know the history. You need to read the black psychologists. Read Wade Nobles. Read Asa Hilliard. You need to read the theologians who somehow dealing with Christianity from our perspective. The work of Bishop Stallings and Cain Felder and all these other people who are trying to say, if you want to see somebody in the Bible, you in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is talking about Africa more than it's talking about any place else. This whole world over here, all these things, the so-called holy land, they write, it is the holy black land. And even though they don't somehow give credit, white people are worshiping the practices of Africans. And that you need to know. And then you will have a whole new relationship with the God of the universe. You won't be petitioning no white God no more. You'll be petitioning the God of the universe, the God of your ancestors, the God of humanity, the God of creation. You will be doing that. And once you reconnect it to the power of the universe, can't nothing stop it. Then you'll understand why you're still here. Then you'll understand why the castrations didn't stop your reproduction. Then you'll understand why it is that the killings did wipe you up. Then you'll understand why it was that 300 years of being erased clean of your own memories of who you were, being wiping out your connection with the ancestors, why you're still here and why you're still able to draw upon that power. 
I uh, got to help Harpin finish now. Okay, self-knowledge is number one. Number two, we talk about that restoring self-control. How do you get your life back in your hands? How do we begin to educate our children, build businesses and give jobs? How can we stop going to school to get a job and start going to school to make jobs? When are we going to begin to use the new technology to build a new reality? Knowledge is now accessible by anybody. You don't have to worry about going into the colored library or writing some type of white library to get information. Just go on the internet, go on the internet, and it's all right there. They can't hide it no more. They can't hide it. It's there, wide open. All you need to do is to have someone to direct you to it. And the idea is to keep you stupid so that you go looking for Paris. You go looking for England. You want to know about Oxford. But you don't want to know about the University of San Correg. You don't want to know about the building of Western uh, of African society. You don't want to know about Zimbabwe and the wall of Zimbabwe. You don't want to know about the metal smelting that was taking place long before Europeans got out of the Stone Age. You don't want to know about those things because there's no direction. But you are responsible. The students of this state must direct people to the scholars and to the ideas that will begin to give them liberating knowledge. What comes out of self-knowledge? Self-love, that's number two. We can control ourselves when we love ourselves. You know why black folks do so much black on black crime? They don't love themselves. That's them they're shooting. That ain't the Crips versus the Bloods. That's like black versus black or Mexican versus Mexican. Or even the gangs in Native Americans. That's the Native Americans hating the Native Americans. Why, why, why do we do so many drugs when we know what they will do to us? Because we don't like ourselves. Why do we beat up our women? And we're doing things we never did even on the plantation. We are now beating up our children. That means we're getting crazier. We somehow are engaged in a kind of self-hatred that has reached the level of a science. Why is it that brothers run away from sisters as soon as they see them coming? Mm -hmm. They want any, like OJ's, the classic example. Mm -hmm. He's caught more hell about dealing with white women than anybody on the planet, and every time you see him, he got another one. Mm -hmm. He's out of his mind. Yeah. If anybody ought to go, well, let me see if I can find sisters. <laughs> because when he really got in trouble, didn't nobody show up but people like him. I mean, we were the one cheering for him. I still don't know why. <laughs> we were the one. We were the one praying for him. It was his own family. Even his ex-wives were there, the black one, was there praying for him. None of the rest of them wanted anything to do with him. And the idea is that as soon, before he got out of jail, he'd gone right back someplace else. And that doesn't mean that love does not transcend color. Color is nothing but a superficial distinction based upon a melanin and everything. And the meaning of hearts is real possible. But it's hard to just meet hearts in a culture that is racially based. Mm -hmm. This is a racist culture. Don't you get mad with me. I didn't make it that way. Right. We have been telling you ever since we've been here, people are people. That's what we've been arguing all the time. Now suddenly, you're going to tell us, people are people. Yeah. What, what you're so concerned about. You're just like preoccupied with this race thing. <laughs> and I don't understand your preoccupation. Diversity is the nature of America. We must all respect the diversity of this thing. Hell no. <laughs> be the last time they let me come back. <laughs> so y'all better enjoy because I may not be back no more. <laughs> Look, we, I ain't gonna forget a damn thing. You understand? I can't forget Emmett Till. I can't forget the thousands of black men and women who will live. I can't forget the rapes. <laughs> the rapes and rapes and rapes and rapes and the black women who were desecrated. I can't forget the talent that's destroyed. I can't forget the nearly two million brothers locked up in prisons on this as we speak. That's right. I can't forget brothers and sisters locked up in prisons, <coughs> taken away from their families and their communities because they had
had a rock of cocaine uh -huh. worth less than the powder cocaine uh -huh. that Thomas Dow that Dowdy Jr. boy uh -huh. had. genius is being wiped out in public schools because teachers don't believe in them and don't know how to teach them. Yes. No, I'm not going to forget all the tens of billions of dollars that we made for America uh -huh. and somehow have got none of it back. That's right. No, I will not forget the fact that we died in wars for this country and fought them over and over again and came back doggone them and had to sit in the back of the bus. Uh -huh. No, no, no. I am not going to forget the number of banks that we keep in service by putting millions of dollars in there and can't even get a good loan to build a home. No, I will not forget children growing up hating themselves because they were too black and their hair was too knotty and their noses were too big because of the aesthetic that was communicated to society that if you black step back, if you white stick around, if you brown stick around, and if you white you're all right. You understand, I'm not going to forget that. Why? because we are still infected by that. And the major problem we have, my brothers and sisters, we just don't love us. If we could just love us, there's no stopping what we can do. And now let me tell you something, and this may come as a shock to many of you. Do you know you can love black without eating white? Don't you know you don't really have to apologize to your white friends That's right. about Keep loving your black life. self. Okay. I mean, you don't have to do that. The Jews don't apologize to anybody for hating their oppressors but loving themselves. The Jews don't apologize for not wanting a, 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 a swastika flying in the place where they go. They don't apologize for that. You apologize, well, you know, they really shouldn't be dealing with that Confederate flag thing. That really is not a crucial issue. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Anything that desecrates your identity is in fact, you know, that, 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 that needs to be dealt with. The Jewish people don't apologize for demanding billions in reparations. Mm -hmm. Billions. Right. Billions in reparations. Right. Billions upon billions. billions in reparations. They don't apologize for that. In fact, most of sober-minded Americans support them in that. A few of the, the, the skinheads don't, but that's all right. We don't worry about them. They'll get to retire anyway. But we, have to, we, don't, we have to understand it. But our people have to be convinced that reparations is an appropriate demand. Now, you see, I ain't convinced that they're going to give it up. I really ain't, I, you know, not easy, not easy. But the point of it is, we have to understand it is an appropriate demand. But you can't demand it unless you feel you deserve it. That's right. And God knows that's a, that's, that's a salary owed to my great grandma, right. to my great granddad, who sweated in their kitchens and picked their crops and built this nation based upon the free labor on their backs. That we are owed that. This country is what it is as quickly as it became. It is the strongest, economically most solvent nation in the world because of what they did to us. Because of what they did to the Native Americans. Native Americans need to demand, no, you can't have no more of our land. And if you walk out here again, we're going to kick your butt into the ground. They don't have to apologize for that. And don't send me no doggone teachers from Boston. Let me see some Native American teachers who understand the relationship to our own culture, to our cognitive process. Let us somehow learn to love who we are and stop trying to be like you. Let us begin to understand the relationship we have to ourselves, first of all, and then you can love whoever you want to. I got, a, I got, a, I got news for you anyway. You're nothing but, 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 but putting on because the bottom line is that you can't love anybody till you love yourself. That's right. Right. You're just trying to prove you're worthy of love by getting white acceptance. Mm. You're begging white folks to accept you because you dislike yourself so much. Mm. And as long as anybody or anything white gives you their approval, you're happy. That ain't love, that's dependency of an orphan child. That's an orphan, molested child who has no self-love and no self-respect. And therefore, they'll beg anybody who reminds them
them of the oppressor and the tormentor as a means of getting self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. The only way you can somehow love you is to know you and build it upon a rec recognition of who you are. Self-love, you get it by service. You get it by committing yourself to service our people. That doesn't mean that you can't be nice to other people, fool. <laughs> if somebody's hungry, feed them. <laughs> but feed somebody who looks like you first. <laughs> that doesn't mean that somehow you don't have a right to teach whoever comes to you for your skills. I tell my students every semester when they come into my class, I teach this class at Florida State called the Psychology of the African American. I said, now this class is for black students. I mean, you're students at Florida State, so of course I can't keep you out of here. And God knows you will learn something. But I am the authority in here. I define what this is. And I am directing my message to the African American students in this room who will have no other opportunity to experience their psychology in their entire experience of training in this institution. So therefore, I'm doing my mission. Now you are happy to be you are happy to have you here, but be respectful and be humble. And don't forget, I got the role book and I give the role. can't do that kind of stuff. Yes, I do. <laughs> and you know how I do it? And I've been doing it in Florida State for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Nobody tried to fire me. In fact, I tried to quit several times. They begged me to stay. <laughs> so I, I quit partially and just go teach this one class. And the thing is, is that I find, and the historians will tell you the same thing, you don't get respect until you respect yourself. Right, right, right. Now, Black folks are more afraid of what we do than white folks are. Right. White folks understand the power of self-love and self-respect. Right. They are engaged in doing it for themselves. They celebrate themselves. They don't want you imitating them. Mm -mm. They don't care if you can parler vous français or not. <laughs> but if you can tell them the relationship to the, to the, uh, the, the etymological origins of their language to your language, then they can begin to respect you. If, they can, if you know all there is about the Irish potato revolution, that's well and good. But if you also understand about the development of the Yoruba people, yes. about the Igbo people, mm -hmm. if you understand about the religious systems that preceded those of Christianity and the relationship of those ancient systems to what it is now that is claimed as being modern religion, mm -hmm. then they will have greater respect for you. When I talk about psychology, I don't just talk about what Freud did, what Jung did, what Maslow did, what Watson did, what all these other people in Europe did. I tell them about the concept of psychology that was laid out in the design of the pyramids and the Sphinx itself and the whole concept of psychology it really came from the word Saku, which was an ancient committed word coming out of ancient Egypt that talked about the nature of the soul and how the earliest concept of psychology was really talking about the evolution of the soul. Read my book, Light from Ancient Africa. These concepts were somehow ones that preceded anything that was known as the, uh, the study of the meaning of the soul, the psyche, which is what they were talking about in Greece. But the word psyche itself actually came from the ancient African word called saku. And so we laid the foundation. They didn't know that. So they have to look with respect, not just because I told them something they didn't know. They ran into somebody who knows himself. And better than that, loves himself. Not no ego thing. It ain't about Naeem. Naeem is on the way off this planet. I'm passing through. But I'm a part of a people that have always been here, will always be here, and are tied with the direct identity of the Creator. So when I talk about loving me, I'm talking about loving humanity. I'm talking about not being able to actually love humanity until I love myself. Number three, and I'm finished. The last part of regaining self-control is the process of self-determination. Mm -hmm. That is that you must be determined to take control of your life and take it where you want to go. Right. So you need determination to be self-determining. That's the point. You've got to have a vision of being in control. Listen now, don't confuse this with Western concepts of control, which means domination. <laughs> you don't have to dominate to be in control. You want control over your life and your resources. 
I don't want to change the educational system of European American people. I want African American's education to change. Mm. And then it will naturally influence the education of non-African Americans. Mm. They can't tell lies anymore mm. when you're telling your story. Native Americans, you tell your story about who was here when Columbus got here. And they'll stop telling these lies about Columbus discovered your ancestors. They didn't discover no doggone ancestors. They were here, had been here, still here. Columbus came in and captured them. And therefore, you are still paying the price. So, you know, their stories will naturally change when you know what your story is. They can stop talking about the dark continent once you understand the light that came out of the continent. You see, they can stop talking about how slavery didn't occur when you begin to show them the manifestation of strength that was gained by enduring the challenges that were created to the spirit that brought us through that. That somehow they don't have to work, you don't have to worry about them telling stories about your being converted from heathenism into a spiritual system. When you begin to understand, let them understand how you transform their spiritual system into a transcendent system that somehow serves as leadership for even their spirits. When they somehow make it spirit into a, a rational, uh, intellectual thing, you somehow speak it through the very spirit that's inside. You need to somehow let them understand who you are first. And that begins to transform what they can be. That's the challenge. Control means you got to have a vision. I have a vision, not of being in their system. I've got a vision of somehow creating a better system for them and for us. I've got a vision. I've got a vision for being able to raise the intellect above the power of technology and begin to fuse it with the greater power of spirituality, so that there is a moral consciousness that guides me when I go on the internet. So I don't have to go to the child pornography sections every time I get on the internet. That somehow I can begin to see this as an instrument to bring empowerment to people all over the planet. Not a way to somehow lock people out of the economic, out of the intellectual, out of the whole spiritual aspects, access of this country that somehow I want people to be able to use what's there to service the rest of humanity. My vision is not to be a token presence in the White House, but I want to paint the White House another color and suggest that it is multicolored. And if you want to talk about real diversity, let's put it at the top. Not just somehow as someone sitting under the tutelage of white leadership, but someone who is telling white folks what to do when they're wrong. Not following their policy. Uh, at this C-SPAN thing, the symposium in Washington a couple of weeks ago, it was so interesting to hear the black Republicans advocating for the Bush policy. Yeah. Where your policy, fool? <laughs> what are you telling Bush? Now, he's got a plan. He's got an agenda. And I, don't, I ain't mad at it. He's doing what he's supposed to do. And that is to preserve the power of a certain leadership class in this nation. To somehow preserve it and keep others from intruding upon it. But here are these Negroes, intelligent Negroes, mm. who have no ability to affirm what it is they are bringing to the table. So I submit to you that my vision is that not that you will be a token presence in human power, but you'll be a part of the planning staff for human power while stealing enough information to come back and start your own thing. Stealing, but that's basically what it is. <laughs> Everybody got an intelligence operation except you. Okay. You are so loyal. And you go and make everybody, multi-millionaires, hit the glass ceiling and the first one's fire. Okay. I think you need to go there and do the famous habits of your ancestors. Scratch, bow, uh -huh, uh -huh. grin. <laughs> do what's necessary to get access to the access code that has the 20-year projection plan for the major corporations in America. Wear the finest corporate America suit. Go there looking just like they want you to look. Cut off your locks. Cut off your, don't go, don't wear no kitty cloth. If they don't want you to wear it, 
If they think it's cute, wear it. <laughs> Go there and like out, out, Euro, Euro. Come on. But you got a mission. You are officially hired as the spook who is going there to sit down the door. Do what they think you're doing by simultaneously preparing to empower yourselves. You can't steal what belongs to you anyway. If they won't give us reparations, we can begin to very gingerly do like the cooks used to do in their kitchen. You won't pay us enough so we'll feed our whole family. It's what we can bring home from like overcooking. <laughs> just a little bit too much. So we'll produce just a little bit too much and take it home. Okay. Our young people will have to be able to somehow find ways to master resources. And we have to be the ones to provide them. So I submit to you, and my challenge to you is this. We are no longer under the control of European American people. That's right. Slavery is over. The plantation system is over. Mm -hmm. Even racism is dysfunctional. It doesn't Say work it. anymore. Right. And the only thing that stands in our way it's is us. ourselves. That's right. That's right. If you do not take advantage of the power that the God of the universe has given you, the power that is being transmitted to us by ancestors who would not take no for an answer, if you do not take advantage of the visions to be able to build a world based upon doing the best for yourselves, the best for your people, and providing leadership for all humanity. Being able to interact with the Native American people, being able to interact with the Hispanic people, being able to interact with the Asian people, helping the Asian people, the Hispanic people, and the Native American people to understand that they cannot afford to believe the lives that have been created about us as a means of dividing them against us and understanding that their oppression is being justified by them being able to participate in our oppression. Let them understand that we are all brothers and sisters of humanity, and we have to restore a consciousness and a conscience of humane thinking in this society because it is not there because the oppressed people are the only ones who are qualified to rise above the oppression and provide spiritual and transcendent leadership to restore a moral consciousness to transform this society. If we don't do it, it won't get done. Peace be unto you.
participating in our talent care meeting tomorrow. We encourage you to come out.